We are proud to welcome you to the Exceptional Advisor podcast series, brought to you by the Investments and Wealth Institute. The goal of this series is to help you better serve your clients, differentiate yourself from the competition, and enhance your ability to communicate those differences. The Institute is a professional association, advanced education provider, and standards body for financial advisors, investment consultants, financial planners, and wealth managers who embrace excellence and ethics. Through our events, continuing education courses, and acclaimed certifications, which include the Certified Investment Management Analyst, Certified Private Wealth Advisor, and Retirement Management Advisor certifications, we deliver Ivy League and practical education for investment and wealth professionals. Hi, I'm your host, Bob Powell. I serve as the editor of the Retirement Management Journal, which is published by the Investments and Wealth Institute. And I also serve as the editor of Retirement Daily, which is published by The Street. Today, our topic is the SECURE Act, and our guest is Jeffrey Levine, who is the Director of Ed- Advisor Education for Kitsis.com, CEO and Director of Financial Planning for Blueprint Wealth Alliance, and the lead creator and content expert for Savvy IRA Planning, which is offered through Horse's Mouth. Previously, Jeffrey served as Ed Slot & Company's Chief Retirement Strategist. So welcome to the podcast, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, our pleasure. So for the benefit of our listeners who may not be familiar with you and your work, do you mind just giving us a brief uh, bio? Uh, sure, absolutely. So uh, my name is Jeffrey Levine, and I am a CPA, CFP, PFS, a whole bunch of other letters after my name. But uh, I think what's really important is how I spend my time. And um, how I spend my time is a uh, portion of it is spent in practice, like many of uh, you listening today. So seeing clients, working in an advisory practice, I am the uh, CEO and Director of Financial Planning for Blueprint Wealth Alliance, which is a registered investment advisor in New York. And then in addition to that, I also serve as the lead financial planning nerd. Yes, that is the real title uh, for Kipsis.com, which many of you are probably familiar with as a, uh, a resource for advisors to get unbiased information. And of course, uh, I also uh, teach and uh, am an instructor for some of the IWI courses. So that's, uh, that's a nice little tie in here as well. So what's uh, essentially you could say is I spend half my time working on education uh, to help Uh, influence our profession and to raise the bar on education for our industry. And then I spend the other portion of my time actually in practice living and breathing and eating my own cooking, so to speak. Right. Okay. So we're here to talk about the SECURE Act. In late 2019, Congress uh, 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 voted and approved the SECURE Act and tax extenders, which creates retirement planning opportunities and challenges for many financial advisors. I think uh, one of the things that you wrote in uh, Kitsis, on Kitsis.com in your uh, many-page report is that advisors may spend more time dealing with this uh, than than uh, than what they gained in terms of its benefits. Um so let's uh, and there's a lot to tackle here. I I think we should start with the new IA new IRA rules. Is that a good place to start? Sure. Yeah, it's a good a place as any. <laughs> uh, and obviously, I think the most significant of those for advisors is the change to the the rules for post death distributions for designated beneficiaries. So in the past, uh, many beneficiaries of inherited non-spouse beneficiaries of inherited IRAs could stretch the distributions over their lifetime, in essence. But now that goes away. Can you sort of take us through what uh, what now is the what will be the law effective Jan one of this year? Sure. Uh, it's essentially, what the the law did was it changed the rules for designated beneficiaries, and it said that uh, instead of having the ability to stretch distributions over one's life expectancy, designated beneficiaries now are required to, in general, to distribute all the funds that are inherited within 10 years, essentially replicating the five-year rule that applied to certain non-designated beneficiaries in the past, but making it and extending it to 10 years. Now, in doing so, they also created a, a brand new category of beneficiary. So in the past, we had beneficiary is kind of at your top level. And then the decision tree was, is it a designated beneficiary or a non-designated beneficiary? Now the question is, um, if it's a designated beneficiary, is it just a quote unquote regular designated beneficiary, like a, um, you know, an older child, let's say a 30 or 40 year old child, or is it one of this new class of eligible designated beneficiaries created by the SECURE Act, 
which are still allowed to stretch distributions. So a lot of people, including myself, we've, we've called this law the, the death of the stretch. And, and that's somewhat, to be honest, a little bit of a misnomer because it's not like the stretch has gone away completely. Uh, that is the default, if you will, for designated beneficiaries now is, is that 10-year rule, no stretch. However, there are still uh, five classes of beneficiaries that, uh, for lack of a better uh, expression, it's, it's business as usual. It's exactly the same rules as we had before, no change. Uh, so those beneficiaries would be uh, disabled individuals, uh, and that's disabled as defined under Section 72M7 of the tax law. So same as a disability exception for um, uh, like a, an IRA distribution or 401k distribution being exempt from the 10% penalty. So a fairly rigid, strict definition of what disability is. Uh, also, individuals who are chronically ill uh, on top of that. So that's our first two categories. We also would include in there uh, spousal beneficiaries. So spouse beneficiaries are exempt from these new rules. Uh, then we get finally to individuals who are beneficiaries but are within 10 years of age of the deceased owner. So for argument's sake, if the person passing away was 76 uh, and they left it to their 70-year-old brother, uh, that 70-year-old brother could continue to stretch using the uh, old rules because they're within 10 years of that individual. Now, those were four categories I gave you, and though I said there was five. And the reason I kind of separate those four from the fifth is that those four are, are what I would consider permanent exceptions to the rule. In other words, those beneficiaries stretch as if nothing has changed. The fifth category gets a reprieve, if you will, from the 10-year rule, meaning that uh, the beneficiaries can stretch at least to start, but there's a, a end date on that, and that is minor children of the IRA owner. And those individuals are able to stretch um, until they hit – the age of majority, and then at that point, the 10-year window, uh, the 10-year rule kicks in. So it's kind of a hybrid between the two. The, the four categories I mentioned before, again, being disabled persons, chronically ill persons, uh, individuals within 10 years of the IRA owner's age at the time they pass away, um, and then, of course, uh, spouses, they are permanently, if you will, exempt from this 10-year rule, whereas minor children of the IRA owner they only get a reprieve until they hit the age of majority. And once that happens, then that 10-year rule starts. And of course, if they already are over the age of majority at the time they inherit, we go right into the 10-year rule. So just a quick uh, question regarding spousal benefits. Uh, in the past, uh, spouses had the option of rolling the IRA into their own or or using the, the stretch. Is, is that still the mm -hmm. case or – is that it is. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. Yes. OK. So in terms of planning opportunities for financial advisors, investment managers, uh, are there some things that they should be thinking about uh, doing? Uh, obviously, reviewing all their clients, IRAs and the beneficiary designations. Is that sort of step one? That, I was going to say that is the first and foremost step one. And unfortunately, it, it could not be any more urgent. Uh, you know, as we record this uh, on January uh, 1st, uh, this was obviously we're recording just afterwards, but on January 1st, uh, David Stern passed away, you know, longtime uh, MBA commissioner and so forth. And, you know, it, uh, it got a lot of attention and press, obviously, because he was, he was very, but it, it, it goes to show like somebody was going to die January 1st. Somebody's going to die January 2nd and 3rd and 4th. And, you know, by the end of January, just one month uh, into essentially the enactment of the new law, about 10% of all the people that are going to pass away in, in, in 2020 will have already died. And those individuals, you know, they might be significantly impacted by these changes. Who you wanted to be your beneficiary before this law came out and who you want to be your beneficiary afterwards may not be the same. So uh, for argument's sake, maybe in the past, a, um, an individual was, uh, let's just make a scenario here. An individual had a, uh, a second spouse and they also had a, a significant IRA. And in the past, maybe they decided, you know what, I, I've got enough life insurance. I'll leave the life insurance to my second spouse and I'll have my IRA go right to my children. Uh, this way they can stretch over their much longer life expectancy. 
Well, now that may not be the case. Now it might be reversed. The spouse may actually have a longer period of time to withdraw that money out of the IRA than the kids. And maybe you're better off leaving the spouse the IRA or a Roth IRA and leaving the kids life insurance or so forth. And that's just that's just one example. But every single beneficiary needs to be reviewed and updated. And in particular, uh, especially for wealthier individuals who are by, you know, by the very nature, more likely to have a trust named as their beneficiary. Uh, those individuals should be given like the highest of highest of high priority because many of the trusts that were drafted in the past will no longer work very effectively going forward. Mm. So uh, with respect to the trust, uh, right, many trusts were set up so that the RMD would be distributed um, uh, uh, based on the beneficiary's life expectancy. But now with the 10-year rule, the, that RMD may not be doesn't have to be distributed right and and may could only be distributed at the end of the 10 year period in the trust in the trust case yeah so what you end up with is a, a situation where really every trust needs to be reviewed and looked at the, you know the language needs to be looked at and understood uh, precisely because how will it work and and what exactly does the trust say so for argument's sake there uh, um or or for you know as a quick refresher for those who are listening um, broadly speaking, you know, trusts are not designated beneficiaries, and in the past they were not able to stretch. However, uh, there is a special category, if you will, of trusts known as see-through trusts, where if a trust met certain rules, uh, namely it was revo- uh, irrevocable rather under uh, at the time of the owner's death, it was valid under state law, uh, the beneficiaries were identifiable, and a copy of the trust was given to the custodian by October 31st of the year following the year of death. Uh, If a trust met those four provisions, then you are able to look through or see through the trust, that's where it gets its name, to the oldest applicable trust beneficiary. And then once you had that see-through trust, there's two categories of trusts that fall under that. You have conduit trusts and discretionary trusts. And the primary difference between the two is that conduit trusts, by their very nature, require the the minimum distribution each year to come out of the inherited IRA, go into the trust, and then get passed right out to the trust beneficiary. That is what makes it a conduit trust. And a discretionary trust was anything else. So this one category in particular, a conduit trust, uh, typically had wording to the effect of, as um, as, as, uh, the required minimum distributions that are distributed from the IRA each year shall be received by the trust and shall pass immediately out to the trust beneficiaries. And the reason that was done in many cases was, first off, it's just an, it's a simpler trust to draft and to implement. It also ensures that those beneficiaries do get you know, some income each year, so you're not leaving everything up to the, uh, the trustee's discretion there. Uh, it, you know, the, the heirs of the trust at least get a little taste, if you will, of the IRA. Um, It also made sure that those beneficiaries paid tax on those RMDs at their own rates rather than having those IRA distributions from the inherited IRA getting stuck, if you will, in the trust and subject to trust tax rates, which are highly compressed and which tend to accelerate the taxation of a uh, individual retirement account. So with that said, you know, many trusts were drafted with that in mind, where the language essentially said, only the you know at, at the required minimum distribution that is uh, necessary each year will come out and go right into the trust and then be distributed. And in the past, if you had you know a, a thirty or forty year old beneficiary of a trust or even older, it wasn't necessarily a, a, a big chunk, right? Even a forty year old uh, had a you know like two and a half percent of the tr- of the uh, of the IRA as a distribution. So it wasn't a, a huge issue to pass out that distribution each year. But now, as we flip forward to these new rules, if that same trust is forced to take everything out over a 10-year period, it's not even a 10-year period for that trust because the trust might dictate that only the required minimum distribution be taken each year, and then it all get passed out. And if we look at the 10-year rule, uh, I mentioned earlier, it's similar to the five-year rule, just over a 10-year period. The 10-year rule says, Everything has to be out by the end of the 10th year after the year of death. But there's no interim requirements. It's not take one-tenth of the 
uh, you know, of the amount out each year. That would be a required minimum distribution of, of one tenth of the amount. Instead, again, it's just take everything out by the end of that tenth year, which essentially means there is no required minimum distribution for years one, two, three, four, and so on up to year nine after the year of death. And the entire account balance is a required minimum distribution in year 10. So effectively, with some of those conduit trusts, what you end up with is a situation where everything that was left to this trust will be kept in the inherited IRA until the 10th year after the year of death. Then and only then, it will all come out in one shot. It will go right through the trust and right out to the trust beneficiaries, taxable all at once which um, is not efficient and also really eliminates the protection that was offered by the trust. You're essentially saying by the end of the 10th year, no matter what happens, the beneficiaries are going to get this money and whether they have creditors or they're going through divorces or whatever it is, they, they, you know, that money is now in those individuals' hands. And, and that's just conduit trusts. Mm -hmm. Discretionary trusts have their own sorts of issues. Um, primarily that now, instead of stretching over a, you know, a lifetime, 20, 30, 40, 50 years or more in some cases, you now are having all those distributions potentially distributed out from the inherited IRA and kept in the trust over just a 10-year period. And again, going back to those trust tax rates we talked about before, uh, anything more than roughly $13,000 it is taxable at the highest rate, 37% tack on state, maybe local taxes, and very easily, even a, a nominal distribution each year could be taxed at essentially 50% when you combine all these taxes. And you have to ask yourself, if the trust is for protection, you know, what are you really protecting at this point? How bad could the beneficiaries do on their own when 50% each year is getting lost to taxes before they touch a dollar? Mm. So not to paint this with broad brush strokes, but it sounds like on the one hand, it might be useful to, as you're reviewing the beneficiaries, to either replace the trust as a beneficiary or perhaps revise the language of the trust. Yeah, you, you have to go back and, and look at all this and, and decide again. What's, so I, I think it just takes you back to the initial conversation that I, I believe everybody should have when they're looking at naming a trust as an IRA beneficiary. And that's taking the old scales of justice, if you will. And on one side, placing cost and complexity, and on the other side, placing control and weighing those two things. Which is more important to you? Avoiding the cost and complexity that comes along with naming a trust as your IRA beneficiary, because let's face it, doing so brings along both of those things, often in spades. Um, or is the control more important to you? And, and there's no right or wrong answer. It's a different choice for, for every individual, for every person, for every situation. Uh, for instance, you know, take a situation where you're leaving your IRA to a special needs child. Uh, well, in, in that case, you know, really doesn't matter. You need the control. The whole point of the special needs trust is to exercise that control so benefits aren't lost. And in that regard, you know, the cost and complexity that comes along with it really is what it is. There's just not much choice. On the other hand, if you were using a trust in previous years because you know, you thought maybe you know, the kids were younger and do you really want them to step into a million dollars right away? Perhaps, it would, you know, maybe you say to yourself, you know, really don't want them to have a million dollars right away. But if my choice is all this other cost and complexity and now it's going to have, you know, even more significant ramifications, maybe now I lean towards not having the trust. And I'll tell you, if, you know, if your listeners speak with attorneys they're probably going to get a different answer. You know, I, I have this debate quite often uh, with attorneys uh, on the regular. Uh, and you know, they say, well, you know, what about protection and what about this and what about, and they're all valid points. Um, but I think, you know, my, my belief is, is as such that we, as stewards of our clients' uh, funds, we not only need to be practitioners, but we need to be what I like to refer to as practical practitioners. Meaning it has to actually work in, in real life in order for it to make sense and be a viable solution for a client. Um, and I can tell you, having reviewed hundreds of trusts over the year, literally hundreds of trusts, um, and I'm not an attorney, but I, I'm a tax guy and I, I understand the language that needs to be in there or should not be in there when it comes to the specific tax treatment of see-through trusts, etc. I can very comfortably say 
that well upwards of 80% of the trusts I've reviewed would fail to work in the way the individual thought they were because there was some provision that was in there that shouldn't be or some provision that probably should have been in there but was not. Um, and the problem is, is that when you go and you listen to individuals lecture on this at a great conference, they're always the best attorneys, right? That's why they're teaching. That's why they're educating uh, out there. And if everyone could have every single trust drafted by just those individuals, my goodness, then, then sure, I think it would be a lot better. But the reality is not every trust is drafted by a, a Natalie Choate or a Cy Goldberg or, you know, or, or, or somebody, you know, in that category. And so uh, in that regard, it becomes a, a real, again, a, a delicate balancing act. And I think one of the most meaningful discussions that an advisor can facilitate is going back to that scales of justice scenario and saying, which is more important, cost and complexity or control? And eventually one of those has to win out because you you will sacrifice the other to, you know, if you want control, you're going to sacrifice cost and complexity. If you want less cost and complexity, you're going to sacrifice control. That's just the way it is. All right. So let me let me uh, move on to a question that I've gotten uh, received from readers uh, uh, since the act was uh, put into law, uh, having to do with the the ten year rule for at least non trust beneficiaries and and not the eligible beneficiaries that we referred to a second ago. But there's no reason, for instance, if you had a hundred thousand dollar IRA and you're the you're the recipient, you're the benefit designated beneficiary, you're the son of a parent, and you uh, inherit a hundred thousand dollar IRA, you could you could. There's no nothing to say that you can't take that distributions in ten thousand dollar increments, say over ten years, or or some other number, and then take the remainder at the end of year ten. Is that, is that? absolutely? Yep. You you have total flexibility. Um, so if you expect, uh, you know, you, and you have you want to look at individuals and say, you know, what is what is the likely path of their own income and deduction? So for argument's sake, let's say an eighty five year old passes away and leaves the IRA to their 60-year-old child who's planning to retire at five years at 65, they may decide, I'm going to take nothing from, you know, from 60 to 65, and then at 65 to 70, over those next five years, I'm going to take it over that period of time. Uh, whereas, let's say someone who dies and leaves uh, an IRA to their 50-year-old child who is still working and expects to have relatively similar income over the next you know, decade or so, that individual may want to spread out that income as much as possible. So to your point, take it over 10 years. And in fact, um, if, if death occurs early enough in the year so that there's time, you can actually take that 10-year window and make it an 11-year window. So for argument's sake, we're filming or we're recording rather early in, uh, in, in 2020. If someone were to pass away now and leave their IRA to their uh, their child who is not eligible for one of the exceptions to the 10-year 10, 10 window we talked about, uh, that child could take some money out of the inherited IRA today and then over the next 10 years, beginning next year as well. So you could actually potentially stretch it out over as many as 11 tax years. So it sounds like in terms of if you're an investment advisor, financial planner listening to this, it, working with the client's CPA would be critical for people who might who have who may be receiving a a, a a inherited IRA for just a no doubt timing exactly when those distributions should occur. You know, you want them in either years of low income or years of high deduction. Kind of, I, you know, you, you you can make the case that it's a very similar decision tree process to when would you do Roth conversions, right? The only difference here is that you don't have to do a Roth conversion where here the money is going to have to come out at some time. Uh, but in terms of Roth conversion analysis, we're typically looking at, you know, when is my income low? When are my deductions high so I can pay tax at the lowest rate? It's a very similar situation now with these 10 years that we have. Okay. So let's move on to what's happened with respect to RMDs and the changing of the date for which RBDs are and also the removal of the uh, of the contribution age limit, uh, uh, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. So we a uh, num number of changes for individuals at or approaching uh, age 70 uh, to age 72. Uh, the first being is that we've pushed back required minimum distributions um, from 70 and a half to age 72. And that um, that change is only effective, however, for individuals turning 70 and a half in 2020 and later. So one of the questions that came up rather frequently um, was, what happens if I'm 70 and a half in 20, uh, 
uh, in 2019, but I only turned 71 in 2020. Do I not have to take an RMD? And the answer, unfortunately, there is no, you still do. If you turned, uh, if you turned 70 and a half before 2020, so in 2019 or, uh, or earlier, you are still on the old rules, if you will. However, for those who turned uh, seven and a half beginning January 1st, 2020 or later, uh, they are now able, able to uh, push off required minimum distributions until they reach age 72, which uh, interestingly enough has kind of a, a bigger benefit for those born in the first half of the year because they actually end up with two more years of tax deferral uh, based on this change than those born in the second half of the year, just simply by the way uh, the rules were previously structured. So again, now we end up with everybody at age 72. And I think actually the biggest benefit of this for advisors is people know when they turn 72. Right. It's an easier conversation now to have with clients. You know, hey, when you turn that, that's when you have to start taking required minimum distribution. Oh, okay. I get it. That makes sense. So uh, so I think that's kind of, uh, you know, I think that's a very, uh, a nice kind of side effect, if you will, of, of the change. Uh, in terms of actual planning, one of the things it does is it allows us to have potentially a year or two more of, of, of gap years, right? Uh, meaning that we will have uh, lower income than before the required minimum distributions kick in. And oftentimes, those are good years to make Roth conversions for individuals. Now, it's a little more complicated because traditionally your gap years um, have been the years in between when you retired and when you started taking Social Security and took RMDs. And that, in the past, lined up rather nicely, right? You started RMDs at 70 and a half. You started Social Security at 70. So generally, you know, same tax year, pretty close. Now, um, Social Security, you're never going to delay more than age 70. It just doesn't make sense. Um, you know, you get no benefit for doing so. So if you have someone, let's say a client who's retired at 65 and you're looking at doing conversions in these gap years, You've got kind of five years of your traditional full gap years, potentially, right, if they delay Social Security, uh, where you can make these conversions. Then at 70 to 72, you've got what I'll call semi-gap years, meaning uh, you've got to, you know, you've got to factor in, let's say, a tax on the Social Security income, which would be taken by then, but you still don't have the requirement of distribution. So that's probably the biggest single planning benefit. Um, some other ancillary things are, are tied to it, for instance. Uh, you had mentioned spousal beneficiaries before, and do they still have special rules? And the answer they mentioned was yes. And one of the special rules that spouses have is they don't have to take required minimum distributions, even from an inherited IRA that they're stretching until the decedent um, would have to have started taking their own required minimum distributions. So that too is now pushed back to 72. But the biggest planning benefit for most people is just going to be those two extra years where you can keep income low. You know, that only really benefits individuals, of course, who, who have the ability not to need that income in the first place. Uh, but for a lot of the advisors listening today, that, that makes up the bulk of their clients, right? They work with higher income, high net worth clients, and they're able to uh, to delay that income as long as possible. Okay. So a question I received uh, in terms of folks who turned 70 and a half in 2019, they have to take their RMD by April 1 of 2020. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct, right? They they have if you are 2019 or earlier for your age seven and a half, then you follow the rules as if the Secure Act never occurred. Your requirement distributions are exactly what they would have been uh, before this law, and they stay the same afterwards. Yep. Okay. And there's no case where those who turned seven and a half in 2019 would have to take two RMDs in 2020, April one, and then by December 31st. Just if they had waited, right? If they if they had waited until April first, then they'll still have that, that that double up this year. So for many individuals, if they were seven and a half last year, um, hopefully they took their distribution last year. And and in fairness, most would have probably done that anyway, since the Secure Act was passed so late in the year. No one really knew that uh, any changes to the requirement of distribution rules were, were going to happen anyway. Uh, you know, this was uh, the eleventh hour once again. <laughs> right. Okay. So in terms of re uh, required minimum distributions, uh, many folks who didn't need their RMD and who were charitably inclined would use the QCD to uh, satisfy their RMD and also their charitable inclinations. Uh, there's been some changes with or some opportunities with respect to the QCD because of the new... Yeah. So the, I think, yeah. So the biggest, uh, the biggest impact to the QCD rule is actually not um, from the requirement of distribution rules, but has to do with a new rule for uh, making contributions 
after 70 and a half. So interestingly enough, the, the pushback of the required minimum distribution did not change the age at which QCDs can be done. So those qualified charitable distributions, which just as a refresher for, for those listening, is that rule that allows you to send money from your IRA or inherited IRA directly to charity provided you're 70 and a half or older. And while there's no deduction received for the income sent, uh, it's actually better than getting a deduction because the income is never included in your gross income to start with. So has benefits, particularly for those who don't itemize or for those individuals who want to keep not only taxable income, but also AGI lower. So it, it's a, generally a much better way of giving to charity than, let's say, writing a check. Uh, the, the age at which that can be done is still age seven and a half. Uh, so there was no impact there. However, a, a separate section of the, um, of the SECURE Act, uh, I actually have the, the page right here. So it was uh, Section 107 of the SECURE Act. So Section 107 of the SECURE Act repealed the maximum age for required, excuse me, for, for IRA contributions. In the past, uh, prior to 2020, you were not allowed to make a traditional IRA contribution once you reached the year you turned 70 and a half or in the future. And, you know, that was the only retirement account that was subject to that restriction. Every other retirement account, whether it be SEP IRAs, simple IRAs, Roth IRAs, 401ks, you go down the list, every other retirement account, if you were still working, you were able to make a, a contribution, but not traditional IRAs. Well, the SECURE Act eliminated that restriction and said, there is no more age limit. As long as you're working and you've got compensation, uh, which for most people is either self-employment income or W-2 wages you can make a traditional IRA contribution. Uh, but Congress was apparently very concerned that people would use this newfound ability to make a traditional IRA contribution, coupled with the ability to make QCDs to kind of skirt the charitable contribution rules. And so what they did was they came up with a anti-abuse rule that I think, you know, the listeners to this call really need to focus on because, again, many of their clients are going to be charitably inclined. And, you know, because they are also wealthier, higher income, et cetera, uh, they may have, if they are still working at, uh, past 70, the ability, unlike many others, to continue to contribute to their retirement accounts as opposed to using all that money to live on. So the, uh, the rules essentially say that beyond 70 and a half, you can continue to contribute. However, to the extent, and this is a little complicated to do just uh, without seeing things, but I'll try to make this as, as simple as possible. To the extent that an individual makes deductible, that's the key here, deductible traditional IRA contributions in the year they turn seven and a half or later, any amounts that are distributed as QCDs that would otherwise qualify as QCDs are reduced by those amounts. So for argument's sake, let me give an example, I think, that will make this a little bit clearer. Let's say, um, you know, John is 70 and a half this year, still working, doesn't need the money, et cetera. So makes a traditional IRA contributions that's deductible of $7,000. Le and let's say that goes on for next year as well. OK, so now John has $14,000 of deductible contributions made to his traditional IRA. And in 2021, John also has to start taking required minimum distributions from his IRA at age 72. And he's got an $8,000, let's say, required minimum distribution. Well, even though uh, John might be very charitably inclined and might follow all the regular QCD, the Qualified Charitable Distribution Rules, and have the $8,000 that's his required minimum distribution sent right from his IRA to a charity, meets all the other rules and restrictions, that $8,000 won't be treated as a QCD. Instead, that anti-abuse rule I just mentioned says, well, John already had $14,000 of deductible IRA contributions. We are going to first offset that fourteen or that, that $8,000 QCD amount with $14,000. And obviously, that fully offsets it, right? There's more than $8,000 there. So year one, John's entire eight thousand dollar RMD is not a uh, is not considered a QCD. It can be considered a, a regular charitable contribution, but it doesn't get that special QCD status. So if John doesn't itemize, he gets no benefit. If uh, John is close to getting phased out, let's say of a uh, a break based on his AGI, 
the R, the regular IRA distribution of $8,000 will increase that AGI. And even if he gets an itemized deduction of $8,000 afterward for the regular charitable contribution, it will reduce taxable income, but not AGI because it's an itemized deduction. So that's, that's, that's not good, right? But it is the way it is. Let's fast forward to the following year where John once again has another $8,000 required minimum distribution, and he sends it once again to charity, but has made no further deductible contributions. Well, we started with $14,000 of deductible contributions, and we had previously offset $8,000 of what would have been QCDs. So that leaves a amount of $6,000 of those traditional IRA contributions, if you will, that have not yet offset other QCD amounts. And so that would, in that second year, on that $8,000 amount, offset another $6,000, meaning $6,000 more would not be treated as a QCD, but would be treated as a regular charitable contribution, a regular IRA distribution, followed by essentially the client writing a check to the charity. And that last $2,000 on top that would qualify as a QCD because we will have exhausted, if you will, all those deductible post 70 and a half contributions. So hopefully that made sense to everybody listening. And just again, to kind of recap and to simplify, to the extent you have made any deductible traditional IRA contributions at age 70 and a half or older, and then afterwards, you make qualified charitable distributions those qualified charitable distributions will be reduced and treated as regular IRA distributions followed by checks to, made out to charity until you've offset all your post seven and a half deductible IRA contributions. So it's kind of a, so frankly, it's kind of a lame rule, uh, especially for those with larger IRA balances who we're going to give to charity anyway. It kind of really disincentivizes them to continue to contribute to their traditional IRAs. But whether I think it's lame, you think it's lame, everybody listening, it doesn't matter. It is the rule and we've got to learn to live with it. Right. So when I think about the SECURE Act, it's a, it's a secure job security for CPAs who have to deal with some of the complex rules here. Just a joke. That's right. <laughs> no, no, that's it's fair. Just, just a joke. So um, uh, I know we, we uh, we're – I want to be conscious of our time here, Jeffrey. Um, with respect to 401k provisions, there are a good many things that uh, apply to the 401ks, um, uh, including something that's been talked about for a good many years, uh, MEPs or multi-employer uh, plans. Um, can you address what's going on with that and what advisors need to know about MEPs? Sure, absolutely. And then the first thing I'll do is, I, and I hate to do it, Bob, but just to, to make sure that we don't confuse anybody. So the, 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 the MEP would actually be multiple employer retirement plan and not multi-employer retirement plan. Correct. And it sounds <laughs> like it's, uh, you know, like it should be exactly the same thing. Like what the heck is the difference? But those multi-employer plans or those Taft-Hartley plans, uh, you know, typically like union plans, et cetera, the, the multiple employer um, plan or, or the MEP is, is the the item that was addressed by the SECURE Act, and it had significant changes. So what, what is it? It's essentially a, a big giant uh, 401k or qualified plan that multiple employers have the ability to plug into, if you will. Uh, and the primary benefit, so to speak, would be that you have economies of scale. You know, Think about it from the advisor's point of view. If you have 17 businesses and each one of them has its own 401ks, with its own provisions and its own lineup of funds. You've got to do a lot of due diligence and education and so forth to analyze all the funds in the different plans and to make sure you're educating participants. You know, there's there's a lot of duplic duplication of, of, of job that doesn't actually produce a real benefit for individuals. But it, when you have multiple plans, you got to do stuff for each plan. What the MEP essentially allows you to do is to gain scale and to, for argument's sake, say, all right, these, this is the, the fund lineup that we offer and any company that wants to come in can plug into our fund lineup and here are the provisions of the plan, et cetera. And so by doing that, theoretically, it, it should be more cost effective and those costs should help streamline both advisors' practices and lower their costs, which in turn should lower the cost to end users. And, and that's really where these plans have uh have seen, you know, have the potential for uh, real progress. Now, in fairness, 
they're not as critical as they might have been had this law change occurred, let's say, 10 or 15 years ago, simply because of the prevalence of low cost options that are available for plans in general, right? In the past, getting, um, you know, 15 years ago, getting low price share classes into a plan was a lot harder for a small plan than it is today. Today, even at a small plan, you can find ways to get you know, ETFs or low-cost mutual funds, et cetera, into a plan and, and, and you know, build out a plan that way. That said, there are still some benefits of economies of scale. And you say to yourself, well, Jeff, if, if this would have been beneficial before, you know, especially maybe even more so, why didn't we see these things? Why, why, why aren't MEPs everywhere? And the answer is really a two-part answer. The first part is there was a IRS rule called the one bad apple rule. That's kind of, it's obviously not its official name, but that's what people uh, refer to it as, the one bad apple rule. And what that rule said was that if any single plan uh, or part, uh, like plan sponsor, if you will, any company did not follow the rules for maintaining the plan in accordance with all the standards that we have, then the entire MEP was going to be disqualified. Now, you think about that, right? Let's say you have 100 employers participating in a single plan. Well, who's going to want to take that chance that one of those employers doesn't do what they're supposed to do? And all of a sudden, their employees and their own, potentially, if they're the business owner, life savings are immediately taxable because the whole plan is disqualified. It was a terrible rule, an awful rule. But it was the rule that the IRS had and implemented, and the SECURE Act now eliminates that rule. Uh, instead, it allows the um, it allows the IRS to disqualify only that employer's part. It allows the plan to cure or to rectify any issues that may have occurred. So that's the that that's a a big hurdle that has been removed. the The second issue was one of a, what's referred to as a, a nexus issue, a common nexus, uh, and that was simply that when the rules for uh, MEPs were created. They required a employer to have uh, the, the, the employers participating in the plan to have a, a common nexus. Now, what did that mean? Well, it was left up to interpretation. And initially, you know, the Department of Labor had very, very narrow guidelines as to, you know, who could participate generally, you know, same industry, et cetera. Uh, Early in 20, earlier in 2019, interestingly enough, in response to an executive order from President Trump uh, in the previous year, uh, the Department of Labor actually revised its own guidance and loosened up restrictions and said, you know what, common nexus can now be uh, deemed to be businesses that are in the same business or you know, entities that are in the same business regardless of where they're located or uh, entities that are in the same location. So for argument's sake, you could have had a, uh, a New York state you know, MEP or a California MEP or so forth and allowed only employers from that state or a, a certain, uh, you know, a, a certain city or metropolitan area was allowed. But it was still a restriction. It, could, it wasn't truly open where any business anywhere, regardless of uh, type of industry or location, could just join any plan it thought would be best for its, uh, its uh, employees. The SECURE Act also eliminated that. It said that, you know, we don't we don't need this nexus requirement anymore, and we can have true what are called open MEPs. And, and this has a lot of application for you know advisors. Think, think about this, right? Let's say you now um, are an advisor and you work for ABC Financial. ABC Financial can now go out and build out its own multi -empl uh, multiple employer plan, and they can offer that plan to any business that wants to be a part of it. That means that uh, all of the you know all of the investment due diligence can be streamlined all the provisions can be streamlined you can have a con you can have every single business in theory that you work with participate in one single plan and you know that plan inside and out because it's the only one that you you really deal with because it's one that you've created that you offer that other companies now, instead of building their own they essentially plug themselves into this plan and and that might revolutionize the way that some advisors go about marketing uh, for 401k business servicing 401k business etc there, there's tremendous opportunity uh, based on this expansion of of maps right and this goes into effect in um, plan years beginning in 2021 so they, there's time for advisors to plan for this change that's right. That's one of the one of the one of the nice um, 
uh, aspects is at least there's some time for this one, unlike some of the other things we talked about, like let's say the, the death of the stretch, if you will, where you know the law was passed and two weeks later, uh, if you hadn't updated your beneficiaries or reviewed everything, you could be in trouble. Uh, so uh, yes, we, we do have some time and, and I would encourage advisors, you know, use this time. If you don't know what MEPS are, I, I've been saying this for, for the better part of the last six months since the Department of Labor loosened the restrictions to begin with, get to know them. Uh, they, they have the potential to be um, pr- a pretty significant influence on uh, an impact on how we go about doing business on a day-to-day basis over the next you know, coming years and decades. Okay. So uh, two uh, two things, if you could comment quickly on. One is uh, the quirky, um, uh, uh, I guess, feature of some 401k loans that uh, were made via credit cards or similar arrangements. Those have been eliminated. I think that's a good thing. Oh, thank God. Um, yeah. And, uh, and, also, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and also just um, there's been a lot of talk about annuities and 401ks now under the, under the Secure mm-hmm. Act. Do you want to just touch briefly on what advisors might need to know about that? Sure. I mean, the first one is, is, thank goodness, you know, as you said, there were a lot of changes to, to plans, you know, a couple of nice things where we added um, a couple of credits for uh, auto enrollment and, and so forth. So there's a there's there's some nice changes there for small business owners who are looking to potentially establish a plan. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the, some of the other things that were, were included, there were actually plans that had uh, that offered loans via like a debit card that you just carry in your pocket. Like you want to go to Starbucks and you want to, you know, a $4 latte, boom, put it on your 401k, no problem. And it would just kind of create a loan and participants weren't really aware of what they were doing or, you know, it just was, it was a really bad, idea. like and, and the all time really bonehead ideas. I'm sure somebody made money off of it and that's why it was done. But in terms of, you know, doing what's right for participants and encouraging good behavior, that is a really really bad idea. Um, so thankfully, the SECURE Act gets rid of that. You can no longer have debit card or, or similar type of arrangement to create 401k loans. That's, uh, thank goodness there. Um, and then in terms of the annuity changes, there are really, um, there, there, are kind of, there are a number of changes that were created under the law. But I think the two most significant ones that were related to annuities are first that there is a, a new rule that allows a annuity be excuse me an annuity to be distributed from a plan if a a plan no longer wants to hold that annuity as an investment and in the past that was a a, a real issue and the other one is that uh, there's a new safe harbor for selecting an annuity in the first place and, and let me start with that one and go a little bit uh, more in depth so uh, you think about a ERISA plan like a 401k, a pension plan, et cetera, the trustees are, you know, are liable, personally liable for, for certain decisions that they make, right? The plan is liable, but the, the trustees are also liable. And if you are a trustee and you're thinking, well, gee, uh, do I really want to give participants the opportunity to invest in an annuity when possibly you know, in 30 or 40 years when they're looking to take payments from that annuity, that insurer is no longer in business and the money that they invested is essentially gone. Now, whether you think that's a likely scenario or not, but it was still a real concern for ERISA fiduciaries. They just did not want to take that chance on the whole, which is why even though today annuities are an allowable investment inside plans, uh, you haven't really seen them uh, to a large degree inside 401k and other qualified plans because of that potential risk that the uh, fiduciaries were exposed to. The SECURE Act creates a safe harbor for selection of an annuity or a lifetime income provider, aka an annuity provider. Uh, and what it does is it, it basically says to fiduciaries, if you gather some, what I'm going to call some pretty basic information, um, and Here's the kicker. You gather it from the annuity company itself. You know, things like we are a a, you know a registered insurer, we're licensed in the state, we're solvent, blah, blah, blah. And and you take these um, warranties, if you will, directly from the insurer, you can assume for ERISA purposes that you have satisfied your fiduciary responsibility of vetting this, uh, of vetting this as an investment and reduce your liability as long as you're not aware of any information uh, to the contrary of what the insurer told you. And and so it really lowers the the bar, if you will, 
on, or, or I would say it raises the bar. Let me go the other way. It really raises the bar on what it would take to find an ERISA fiduciary liable for, for not fulfilling their fiduciary obligation to working in the best interest of the plan. Now, that, that was, again, that was a real issue. So going forward, do I think we'll see more of these things? I do. This was a, a really strong win for the insurance company. It's no secret that insurance companies lobbied hard for this law, like really hard for this law. Um, and this is why they wanted to open up the floodgates for 401ks, et cetera. Now, in fairness, there are some real benefits for certain types of annuities, you know, things like um, and and it's not to say only certain types of annuities are acceptable, but there's a lot of academic research out there that supports things like um, deferred, uh, deferred immediate annuities, things like QLAX, et cetera, uh, for lifetime income and longevity insurance, et cetera, being offered um, and ha having individuals. The, the problem, though, is that. In the past, at least, especially with other plans like 403Bs, et cetera, which don't necessarily have the same ERISA fiduciary protection, uh, but still, they're, they're plans. We've seen a lot of abuse in some areas of uh, what are objectively not very good products, right? A high cost or um, very long surrender schedules, et cetera. And so there's some concern as to whether or not we'll see the same in, in qualified plans going forward. But I do expect there to be a lot more use of these things going forward. Again, that was a big win for the annuity company. Now, the second issue that we touched on before is what happens, though, if you offer a 401k annuity option and then you go through your due diligence one year and you decide, you know what, we no longer think this is an acceptable investment for our plan, but you've had an individual Who's been investing in the annuity forever? What do you do? And again, in the past, there was not a good solution for this. They were, might have had to divest from the annuity. There could have been surrender. To, lots of bad uh, implications for that particular participant. What the SECURE Act says going forward is that if you have one of these uh, situations where you want to terminate the annuity as a bona fide investment from the plan, then beginning in the 90-day window before that investment is actually eliminated, it becomes a distributable event for the annuity, meaning that the annuity itself can be distributed from the 401k and essentially rolled over to an IRA in kind as the annuity, and that participant can keep that investment and the plan can get rid of it. And everybody kind of wins, if you will. The participant doesn't have any negative tax consequences. The annuity carrier gets to keep the annuity on the books. The plan gets to get rid of the investment it doesn't want. Now, you could argue if the plan's getting rid of it, is it really that good of an investment? But that's a whole separate issue. And frankly, plans opt for investments and, and change them all the time. So uh, the, you know, those are two major, major hurdles that were removed when it comes to the usage of annuities inside qualified plans like 401ks. So you're going to see a lot from insurers over the coming weeks, months, and years, um, you know, talking about these changes, uh, pushing them as viable options. And again, th there's certainly an argument to be made that, uh, that having an annuity as an option is a, is a benefit for certain individuals. It's going to be up incumbent upon advisors to help A, uh, help plan sponsors make sure that they're selecting the appropriate annuities to potentially include in their uh, plans if they're going to do so. And then B, working with the participant, making sure that they select only options that are in their best interest uh, and, and potentially in some cases not using the plan option. You know, that that's uh, just because the annuity would be offered by the plan doesn't mean that the participant needs to select that as an investment option. Right. So I think we have time for maybe two quick questions. Uh, there was other provisions in the SECURE Act, one of which dealt with the kitty tax, if you want to mm -hmm. take, take that one on. Sure. Uh, you know, it uh, reminds me of that old Henry VIII song, uh, you know, I'm Henry VIII, I am, and the second verse, same as the first. So we basically just completely reversed everything that happened. Uh, many advisors probably recall from the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, it changed the rules from where kitty taxes were uh, essentially added to parents' income tax at parents' marginal rates. The kitty tax removed that and shifted that income over to trust tax rates, which uh, was good for some, not good for others, but did have the benefit, at least on the operational side, of, of meaning that a kid could file their tax return before the parents did. Uh, that was actually kind of nice. 
Uh, the SECURE Act completely reverses it. It's like the uh, Tax Cut and Jobs Act never happened beginning this year and going forward. Uh, but for previous years, for 2019, uh, individuals will have kind of the opportunity of, of really selecting what they want to use. And for 2018, um, you can actually then go back and amend the return if you want to opt into the old kitty tax rule. So uh, kind of on the list of priorities for advisors should be going back and understanding uh, who filed uh, kitty tax returns in 2018, who is going to in 2019, and particularly for 2018, how big of a benefit would it be to undo or to, to amend the return and to instead of having the income tax at trust tax rates, have the income tax at the parents' marginal rates. Um, and for some individuals, it's going to be quite substantial. I was um, just doing some projections actually for a client of mine who um, had an IRA that was left to grandchildren. And the grandchildren have been paying kitty tax the last few years at trust tax rates. And we figured that each grandchild will save about um, about $4,500 for 2018, and there's four grandchildren. So we're talking about a savings of nearly $19,000 in taxes across the grandchildren by going back and filing an amended return to report that income at the parent's marginal rate as opposed to the trust tax rate. So that's definitely something that advisors should look at. Uh, the good news is that you generally have three years to amend a return, and those returns wouldn't have been filed until you know at the earliest, really, April of last year. So we, we've got about two years um, still to go back and do that. It's not a, a high, high, high priority. It's certainly something you don't want to ignore. Uh, but I would spend my time first looking at things like, again, like checking the beneficiaries first, because that has an impact of potentially today. You know, client gets into a car accident today, there's an impact today. So I would start there, but don't put this kitty tax thing off if it's something that might have applied to your clients forever. Right. Okay. So we've talked a lot about what's in the SECURE Act. There are some things that aren't in the law that we need to touch on? Uh, certainly worth it. Uh, there's a lot of been uh, a lot of confusion. Look, anytime you have a, a, a significant amount of uh, changes passed in, in one time, there's going to be confusion. Uh, when you throw on that it's a, in holiday season <laughs> and everybody's trying to in and out of the office and running, you, know, you get a lot of you know confusion, misinformation, et cetera. So uh, for instance, some of the things that are, are not in the SECURE Act. Uh, one of the things that's not in the SECURE Act, again, we're just to repeat, to be very loud and clear, and, and it, just want to make sure anybody tuning in now or just like, you know, listening in closer now, this is not part of the law. Uh, the first thing I'd say is that homeschooling for use of 529 plans did not make it in there. Uh, interestingly enough, 529 plans are now allowed for certain um, apprenticeships that was expanded as part of the Secure Act, uh, and in addition, you can use up to ten thousand dollars to pay down student debt, um, both interest and principal. So that was expanded as part of the Secure Act. Uh, but some misreporting has been out there that homeschooling was also included. That was not. That was actually the sticking point uh, that held up the Secure Act from getting a vote in the Senate earlier this year. Was uh, individuals like Ted Cruz, etc., had a, a real problem that homeschooling had been removed from the law. It was not added back in. Uh, some other things that are not in the law. Uh, some people have asked, well, didn't they push the RMD age back to age 75? No, it didn't get that far. That was part of a Senate version that didn't get passed. Uh, same thing with a $400,000 exemption for the stretch provisions. That was also included in an earlier version of a bill that is not part of the SECURE Act. So there is no minimum amount exempted from these stretch rules, et cetera. Just as we talked about at the beginning of our chat today, if you're in this, you know, if you're not one of those five categories of designated beneficiaries, again, just as a refresher, disabled individuals, chronically ill individuals, uh, individuals within 10 years of the owner, a spouse, or a minor child of the beneficiary, then you are subject to the new 10-year rule right away. And that's it. doesn't matter the dollar amount of the account. There is no uh, minimum exemption. So those are probably, I would say, the, uh, the three areas where I've seen the most amount of mis, uh, misinformation and confusion so far is that uh, the RMD pushback was only, if you will, till 72, not to 75. There is no dollar amount exemption for the death of the stretch. Uh, and then finally, 
that um, uh, as we talked about, 529 plans did not include uh, a provision for homeschooling expenses. None of that was uh, none of that was part of the law. Right. So I'm going to ask, I guess, two final questions. One is, um, and, and this will be the second one first, but is there anything else that we uh, haven't touched on that we ought to? And then just a question about RMDs and 401ks. My understanding is that if you were still working and you weren't a 5% owner, et cetera, that you were not required to take your RMD from your 401k uh, after the, uh, after it's, uh, formerly 70 and a half and perhaps now after 72. Is that, is that rule been changed or has been affected if you have a 401k? Uh, so take the, uh, the second question first, which was uh, <laughs> the, uh, you know, can you, can you still use the still working exception? The answer is yes. Um, and by default, essentially now we go to 72. Uh, but if you're still working, you're not a 5% owner uh, and uh, you, you meet the other provisions of that and the plan allows you to delay RMDs, yes, you, you can still have uh, indefinite tax deferral by being an active employee um, uh, and having a, a 401k or other plan of that employer. That, that still does apply. Um, just, to, just that the default now, instead of otherwise having to start at 70 and a half, you otherwise have it to start at 72. Um, and also keeping in mind that the April 1st of the year following that date is still the required beginning date. So just like in the past, April 1st of the year following the year to turn somebody turns 70 and a half was their required beginning date, uh, beginning for those individuals turning 70 and a half this year in 2020, it'll be April 1st of the year following the year they turn uh, 72. Um, and then I think you mentioned, is there anything else that's of particular importance in the law? Um, and I would say that there's always more to talk about. Um, there's some changes in there with respect to what can be used to make contributions uh, to IRAs or to Roth IRAs, et cetera. But the one that we probably didn't touch on that will be of uh, most interest to advisors is probably the new 10% penalty exception that applies to uh, withdrawals from IRAs and 401ks and similar plans for either childbirth or adoption. Um, and just briefly, what that new exception is, is it says once the birth or adoption occurs, uh, you, you have a, a year to take a distribution of up to $5,000, uh, and that can be used towards really whatever. There's no mandatory expenses or list of qualified expenses. It's just once you have that qualifying event, which is the birth of a child um, or a uh, adoption, then you can take that distribution. Uh, and that is on a per person basis. So if you have a husband and wife that each have their own retirement accounts, they could each access up to the $5,000 penalty free without the uh, Covered a lot of ground. I, I I think I should, for those folks who have listened to this and want to do a deeper dive, you've written a, I think, a 20-page report that appears on kitsis.com that is fairly comprehensive. And I'm sure you'll be writing uh, uh, beyond that as well as you uncover more things in the uh, uh, in the act itself. But that's a good place for folks to go, right, to get a deeper dive on what we've talked about today. Most definitely. And, and yeah, I can tell you, we've, uh, I've already got about four or five more things queued up that go into some of the topics we've talked about in a lot more depth um, and, you know, where we can really drill down and talk about all the different nuances. Uh, so that, that's probably like the, the opening salvo is the 20 pages, <laughs> but uh, there's a lot more to come. <laughs> All right, Jeffrey, can't thank you enough for uh, being on this podcast and uh, look forward to you coming back on and talking about other things related to retirement and uh, and of things of interest to investment advisors who are members of the Investments and Wealth Institute. Awesome. Thanks so much again for having me, Bob, and best of luck for continued success to everyone listening. Thank you for listening to our podcast. My guest was Jeffrey Levine, Director of Advisor Education for Kitsis.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe through iTunes, Spotify, or our website at investmentsandwealth.org forward slash podcast to get the latest episodes of our Exceptional Advisor podcast series. The Investments and Wealth Institute has been helping investment and wealth professionals become exceptional advisors for over 30 years. Please visit our website at investmentsandwealth.org to learn more about our certifications, conferences, online learning, and continuing education programs.